Hi, welcome to today's NCST mini lecture. Uh, today we're going to be presenting the next installment in our series on transportation fundamentals, talking about alternative fuels. I'm Dr. Colin Murphy, and I'm the policy director at the National Center for Sustainable Transportation. I also work with the Policy Institute for Energy, Environment, and the Economy here at UC Davis. And I'm joined by the disembodied voice of my colleague, who's broadcasting from an undisclosed location. So when you're talking about alternative fuels and transportation, the first question is, why do we even care? And the main answer is because transportation is a major emitter of greenhouse gases in the U.S. and in fact in almost every industrialized country. In the U.S., transportation is almost 30% of total emissions, and that's just from the tailpipe. When you add in the emissions from producing and refining the oil to make it into gasoline and diesel, it adds another 5 to 6%. So over one third of total U.S. emissions come from transportation. And if the U.S. is going to meet some of the most critical decarbonization targets to prevent the worst effects of climate change, that's going to have to change. To avoid the, these worst effects, most industrialized economies have to get to nearly zero emissions by sometime in the middle of this century. And there's no way to do that without having transportation reduce its emissions by quite a bit. Transportation accounts for just around 30% of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. So it's very important a uh, source of greenhouse gas emissions. And even more than that, if you include emissions from oil refineries um, producing the transportation fuels. And the same figure uh, in California is over 50% of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and it's thought that in order to be carbon neutral by the 2050s and uh, and not have uh, the worst parts of climate change that transportation will really have to have make a significant contribution. There have been a lot of interest in alternatives to fossil fuels for transportation for basically as long as the car has been around. Some of the first cars ran on things like kerosene, coal dust, batteries, solid fuels and boilers, or gasoline and diesel. But in the early part of the 20th century, gasoline and diesel came to dominate the, the fuel for vehicles because it was cheap, it could pack a lot of energy into a very small space, and it was readily available as more and more oil fields were discovered. Some other alternatives are starting to emerge. Some of them are using commercially well-established, well-understood technologies, and others are still trying to move from the lab into commercial production. When you talk about alternative fuels, some of the main things you have to think about are, can they be run in the same kind of engine that was built to run gasoline or diesel? If they can, they're probably known as a drop-in fuel, as in you can drop it straight into the tank of your vehicle without having to make any changes. Can they be blended into gasoline or diesel? And if so, is there a maximum amount you can blend before you have to start modifying the engine? If there is a maximum amount, this is often known as a blend wall. For example, most engines right now run on 10% ethanol. That's the standard blend of, of ethanol and gasoline. And most engines could go up to 15% based on the technology that, that they already have. So the, the actual technical blend wall may be at 15%, but right now most regulations keep it at 10. If your engine can run multiple kinds of fuels, then it's probably known as a flex fuel engine. And in fact, in, in the US, a great number of vehicles are already flex fuel vehicles and could run on gasoline or on higher blends of, of ethanol if needed. All of these different kinds of fuels and engines do not perform the same. There's a lot of differences, and this is, these are some of the things we're going to be trying to explain to you today. In terms of alternative fuels uh, that are used in conventional vehicles, ethanol and biodiesel are currently the most common. Ethanol is made from corn in the U.S., sugarcane in Brazil, and other substances elsewhere, starches typically. Uh, and in the U.S., this is blended into conventional gasoline at 10%. There are a fair number of flex fuel vehicles that can burn ethanol up to an 85% blend, but a lot of people don't know that they have those vehicles. Another ver very common fuel is called biodiesel. And biodiesel and renewable diesel are different things. Biodiesel is made from the same kind of stuff as renewable diesel, from things like vegetable oil, used cooking oil, or food processing waste. But it's a simpler, lower energy process, and the product that comes out the other side is not chemically the same as diesel. It's sort of a hybrid, halfway between a vegetable oil and diesel fuel. And as halfway in between, it ha you have to be a little bit careful about how you use it. If it's used in very cold areas, it can get dense and sludgy. Uh, in most cases, it can be blended into diesel up to about a 5 or 10% level without having to modify the engine. To go much beyond that, you may have to start thinking about changing your engine a little bit.
Renewable diesel is a newer fuel but is currently commercial uh, and it's made from the same types of things that uh, biodiesel is but it's hydro treated so used in um, I mean processed in oil refinery type facilities and sometimes old oil refineries and there are no engine modifications needed so it is a drop-in fuel. The last liquid fuel we're going to talk about today are what we call advanced or cellulosic biofuels. These are made from parts of plant matter that are indigestible. So they can be made from things like leaves and stalk and stem or wood chips or waste products like agricultural residue or uh, orchard trees. This is a technology that is still in the relatively early stages of development. There are a couple of commercial facilities in operation right now, but it's been very challenging to get this kind of technology working at a cost-effective and commercial scale. There are also quite a few non-liquid fuels that are of interest. You can also use electricity in vehicles without having to use hydrogen by putting it directly into a battery. Almost all of the electric vehicles and hybrids that you see on the road today have some sort of battery, usually using uh, a chemistry called lithium ion. It's very common. One of the advantages electric vehicles have is that they're three to five times more efficient at turning the stored energy in a battery into motion than an internal combustion engine. The problem with this is batteries take longer to charge. You have to find a place to plug them in. And unlike filling a gasoline tank where you can pour gasoline into a tank in, in a couple minutes, it usually takes at least 20 or 30 minutes to charge if you have a very high power charger, or all night if it's a slower charger like the one you may find in, in most people's homes. There's also concerns about uh, how this is going to affect the grid and how we can simultaneously remove fossil fuels from a power grid while also charging a lot more electric vehicles. These problems can be solved, but it takes some thought on the part of utilities and regulators. The advantage of electric vehicles is there's no tailpipe emissions at all. And if they're being charged with renewable energy, such as from wind or solar, they have incredibly low greenhouse gas emissions, almost zero. Hydrogen fuel cell vehicles also run on electricity, but they are the hydrogen that is converted to electricity via a fuel, fuel cell and stored in high pressure uh, tanks. It's currently commonly produced from natural gas, but it could be produced from electricity and water in the future. Uh, and like electricity, it has no tailpipe emissions. There are also natural gas vehicles, uh, often used in, in heavy duty, um, so substitutes for diesel in, in trucks. And um, they, it can be either fossil natural gas or renewable natural gas. You can also make natural gas in a renewable fashion. As organic matter decomposes, it releases methane. This methane can be captured, cleaned up, and once it's cleaned up, it is basically chemically indistinguishable from fossil natural gas. Renewable natural gas, made in anaerobic digesters like this, can be a very low carbon fuel. Now, all these alternative fuels don't necessarily have the same effects in terms of uh, carbon emissions. Uh, so the fuel and the production system all can have an effect on how the production and use of the fuel affects greenhouse gas emissions. Some policies assess something called the fuel carbon intensity, and that's the unit of motive energy often managed, uh, measured in grams per CO2 equivalent per megajoule. Uh, and CO2 equivalent is just a way of converting greenhouse gases other than uh, carbon dioxide into an equivalent amount of carbon dioxide over an agreed uh, time horizon. And just for um, reference, one megajoule of energy is about as much as is contained in two tablespoons of gasoline. So when we're talking about the carbon intensity of transportation fuels, we need to think about more than just what comes out of the tailpipe of these fuels. We have to think about what goes into making them and bringing them to the market where they can be used. For petroleum fuels like gasoline and diesel, this is a fairly simple process. First, oil is taken out of the ground by an oil well. There's some energy and emissions that occur while they're drilling and, and producing this oil. It's transported from the oil well to a refinery. At the refinery, it's turned into a transportation fuel that requires additional energy inputs as well as chemical inputs and all those energy and chemical inputs have an environmental cost and have some emissions associated and then finally it is taken from the refinery to a gas station often with some stops and storage tanks along the way. All told in most cases for petroleum fuel about 75 or 80 percent of the total life cycle emissions come out of the tailpipe. That is most of its impact on, on the climate 
happens when you actually burn it. Somewhere around 15 to 20 percent are from the production of the oil and the refining. Only a very small amount of emissions come from the transporting the oil, even if it has to come in an oil tanker from overseas. When you talk about biofuels, or most alternative fuels, this can become a much more complicated system. If you're making something like corn ethanol, like is shown in this diagram, first you have to grow the corn. There's fertilizer associated with that. There's the activity of all the, the tractors and farm equipment needed to, to grow the, the, the corn and, and the crop. There's often losses of greenhouse gases from the soil itself when it's under agricultural cultivation. And there can also be things, uh, this, this effect we call land use change, where if we're using corn, which could go to feed people, to make fuel instead, somewhere somebody's going to have to grow more crops to go and feed the people that would have otherwise had the, the corn that we're sending to the ethanol producer. Between all of these, most of the emissions from growing biofuels typically occur from producing the feedstock, that is, the organic matter that's going to go into the process. There are also transportation emissions. There are also emissions to convert the corn into ethanol. In a lot of cases, there are co-products. For example, in corn ethanol, they grind the corn, they extract the sugars and starch from it, make ethanol out of that, but then the leftover parts, the, the fiber and protein, is sold as an animal feed. Once you make the ethanol and the animal feed, those have to be taken to market, and then they're burned and there are tailpipe emissions there. The advantage of biofuels is that most of the carbon that is embodied in that corn came out of the atmosphere. So unlike a fossil fuel, where you're taking carbon that has been stored underground for millions and millions of years and putting it back into the air, for a biofuel, in theory, all that carbon came out of the air, and then within a few months, less than a year, goes back into the air. So much of the carbon emitted when that fuel is burned doesn't change the long-term concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. These previous two slides were just examples of uh, an, an analytical tool called life cycle analysis that takes, uh, that looks at the whole supply chain from the inputs through all the processes, through the products, uh, kind of a cradle-to-grave approach, also accounting for the co-products uh, involved in the process. There are various types of alternative fuel policies that have a carbon emphasis. One is a renewable fuel mandate, such as the U.S. Federal Renewable Fuel Standard. And this typically requires a proportion of transport fuels come from renewable sources, and the blend levels can, or the mandated levels can vary with the policy. But if it ignores life cycle analysis and land use effects, this can be problematic. The U.S. Renewable Fuel Standard, um, this example, does actually em um, employ some carbon intensity reduction requirements. But it doesn't improve, uh, it doesn't lead to or encourage improvements in carbon intensity once the thresholds have been met for the different mandated categories. A low carbon fuel standard, such as California has, uh, sets a carbon intensity target for the entire pool of fuels and then each fuel is evaluated by its life cycle carbon intensity. This system, by contrast, does reward um, a continuous improvement as well as breakthroughs in carbon emissions reductions throughout the supply chain. There are also economy-wide carbon pricing schemes that sometimes include transportation fuel emissions in their coverage. And this places a price on carbon emitted through either a carbon tax or by setting a cap on the uh, maximum emissions allowed. And then the market determines what price that carbon emissions will, will have. These programs typically don't evaluate life cycle emissions and they treat biofuels as carbon-free. So this shows the assessment uh, that California has done on its full slate of low carbon fuels. Each one of the diamonds on that graph is a fuel pathway. Some fuel producer has come to California and said, I can make low carbon fuels in this way. And the state then determines what their carbon intensity is. And what you can see is for a lot of these fuel pathways, there are so many diamonds, it looks like it's just a black smear. There are a great number of producers in the market right now that all have uh, production practices that vary slightly and they typically fall within a certain range of carbon intensities. This is in a lot of ways good. It shows that there's a competitive market out there and a lot of room for improvement as the, these processes keep developing over time. It also shows that some fuels are typically better than others. Things like conventional ethanol 
can't really get you too far down the, the carbon intensity line. Whereas cellulosic ethanol or renewable gasoline are typically much better. You'll notice on there that there are two bars that are very long and can and go very far below zero. Those are the renewable natural gas pathways that I mentioned earlier. When they're made from certain types of waste and they get credit for avoiding the methane emissions that, the, that that waste would have generated anyway, they can be extremely good for the climate to use. But they only have very small volumes. What's really important and what years of experience in this space have taught me is that this, there's nothing simple. There is no way to say this type of fuel is good and this type of fuel is bad. There are no black and white distinctions. It's all shades of gray, which makes it very complicated, but a fun challenge to work on. So thank you for listening. We're happy to answer any questions. Our contact information is on this final slide. Please feel free to reach out to us and ask us any questions you may have. And hopefully we'll see you on future lectures in this series. Thanks.